Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, I'm your host, Brock Palin. I have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for helping out with the show. Hey, Brock. Looks like we've been going on a, a visualization stint recently. <laughs> yes, actually, the topic today we're going to talk about involves two former guests from two different packages that are actually part of this global package we're going to talk about today. But before that, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brock Palin, all one word. And then uh, you can also just find that on the RCE website, rce-cast.com. You can find all of the old back shows there because I think iTunes only shows like the last five or something like that. Uh, and there's also an RSS feed where you can subscribe and be able to read an RSS reader. Jeff, I also think you have a blog. I do. There's a blog pointed off the RCE cast. And the big news in that area is that we are finally a new blogging platform at Cisco, and all of us are very excited about it. Because I think I think the package that we use today is the best blog or so. So we're excited for the uh, the new launch in about a month. Woohoo! Okay, well let's move into our topic again. I mentioned that two of our guests have been on the show, so you probably remember Burke Gavici. Um, who was on about VTK, but he's going to be speaking with us today about Paraview, along with Kenneth Moreland um, from Sandia, who had been on talking about Ice T, which I believe is used inside Paraview. And we have a new guest today, Urket uh, uh, Aichi. He can correct me on destroying his name when he introduces himself. <laughs> but uh, all three of those guys work on Paraview, a uh, visualization package, uh, the details of which we will let them explain. So, uh, Burke, why don't you go ahead and start off. Um, again, say a little bit about yourself for those who haven't listened to the previous show. Sure. Uh, my name is Berk Yeveji. I uh, lead the scientific visualization and the informatics teams uh, at Kitware. Um, Kitware is, uh, for those that don't know, is a small company that about 80 people uh, that focuses on uh, visualization, informatics, uh, image processing. Uh, and computer vision. I've been here uh, for about 10 years. I, uh, the whole time that, uh, I've been developers of uh, developer of VTK uh, and Paraview. I, ha- I was the lead uh, programmer for uh, Paraview for a while, but now um, Utkarsh does that. I'm Utkarsh Ayachet, and uh, I'm a technical lead here at Kitware. And I've been here with Kitware for over six years now. I s- I, I've been working mostly on Paraview uh, as, as a developer. Uh, I've been involved with other projects related to Paraview and VTK, and uh, I guess that's pretty much it. This is Kenneth Moreland from Sandia National Laboratories. I've been the uh, Paraview lead for, at Sandia for several years now. My main interest in the past decade has been in large-scale parallel visualization algorithms and systems. Our research at Sandia has been driven by advanced scientific simulations and world-class supercomputers. During this time, we've been using Paraview as a research and deployment platform. Okay, so why don't you, one of you guys take and give us the 10,000-foot view of what is Paraview and what does it mean to the average research computing user? I can do that. So uh, Paraview is um, a, an application for visualizing uh, scientific uh, data sets. I, um, it, it, it was designed originally for uh, visualizing large data sets, but um, I think um, I don't want to necessarily restrict my definition to that at this point. Um, so the Paraview project started uh, about um, 10, 11 years ago uh, for the purpose of uh, building an end user application around the visualization toolkit. The visualization toolkit at the time was already um, old. It was already, I believe, 10 years old or so. Um, and uh, but it did it, it it's really a developer tool and it there was no way of uh, delivering functionality to to our end users and as we started developing large data visualization functionality uh, in VTK we wanted to be able to um, deliver that uh, therefore we started building a uh, pair view as essentially a kind of an end user extension uh, to VTK uh, since then obviously our main focus has been uh, large data, data analysis and visualization, but um, Paraview uh, has also branched into a lot of other things. So therefore, um, it is used 
commonly for scientific data analysis, both small and large. Um, and it is also a develop, development platform uh, for those that want to actually build upon uh, a toolkit for end user applications uh, and extend it uh, to deliver functionality, again, uh, in the area of scientific visualization, as well as we, we've been doing uh, more and more lately uh, pre-processing of uh, scientific simulations uh, and things like that. So that's, that's a very short summary. Obviously, I'm sure we'll, we'll get more into uh, what Pairview is and what Pairview does. Okay, yeah, so that was, that was a good summary there, Pairview and, and a little bit of VTK there. Uh, round this out with, explain what's the relationship to Ice-T then as well. Ken? Well, I guess I'll take, yes. Uh, so um, Pairview uses Ice-T as a parallel rendering library. So when you're running Pairview in the large-scale parallel mode, uh, you need some sort of mechanism to be able to render images that provide the visual representations. So IST uh, basically provides that uh, capability. That, that ties it all nicely uh, into why you are all working together, the relationships between those those pieces of software. So uh, let me let me jump back to something you guys said earlier. Utkarsh, you said that you were uh, the technical lead on Paraview at Kitware, and Ken, you said you were the lead um, for or Paraview at Sandia. So how do you guys split it up? Do you have different roles or are you leads of different parts of Paraview? How, how does that work? So Paraview um, is, um, is a, lar is a lar larger project that, is, um, that has many contributors, both uh, from funding point of view, um, and, but also from you know, contribution as, as developer contribution. Um, Kitware is really the kind of the hub that where all, all of it comes together. We we started doing the original um, initial development of Pairview, uh, and we con continue to be essentially the, to be the gatekeepers uh, for for Pairview. And um, uh, folks like Ken and others um, are developers of Pairview, and then you know there are leads at different institutions like San Diego, Los Alamos, um, but Kitware kind of manages the whole project and we're responsible of the uh, releases and um, and things like that. Yes, just to elaborate on that, so Sandia um, has been a major contributor to peer review for most of its lifespan. Um, we have our own particular interests. We'll have developers at Sandia working on peer review itself and we'll also have contracts with, with Kitware to do uh, work specific for uh, Sandia's interests. And of course, the reason why we're so keen on peer review is that uh, Sandy and other national laboratories uh, regularly encounter these really large meshes, meshes through advanced simulation and computing program, which typically are much larger than those encountered in academia and industry. So a lot of the other solutions that are just uh, other people are interested in don't necessarily work for, for Sandy as needs. Okay, so in the introduction about what Pair Review was, you asked about, you mentioned that it was kind of like a front end to VTK. Uh, does Pair Review actually implement all of VTK's functionality, or is that just an impossible task to do because of flexibility? Or um, does even Pair Review, does all of its functionality come from VTK, or do you use some other third party libraries? So VTK is basically a toolkit, right? It's a toolkit which provides you the data model, it provides you the pipeline model, the execution model, and all that. And Paraview uses almost all of that the infrastructure provided by VTK for its data processing. But since VTK is a toolkit, it doesn't really have the application level logic to uh, say provide the what happens when the user creates a filter, what happens when the user creates a reader, all that. Application logic is typically uh, not handled by VTK at all because it's a toolkit, and that is left to Paraview to for Paraview to manage, and that's where Paraview deals with it. And also, Paraview adds its own extra things for to VTK to do things like parallel rendering or data distribution and making sure that the data ends up at the right nodes for rendering and so on and so forth. So, all Paraview has almost. It, 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 it does indeed have the entire VTK directly brought in, but not all the filters or readers are exposed in Paraview GUI, uh, but that's only because uh, well, some of them don't really work well in parallel uh, because of that, or other reasons is just because no, the, there's no real, uh, we just didn't feel the need for it. But it's very easy to ha add uh, any of VTK filters into Paraview using plugins or just writing some simple XML. 
So ParaView is a parallel application. Is it a single machine parallel, like you need one of these big SMP machines to do a large data set, or does it use like MPI or some other type of distributed memory architecture? So ParaView supports both configurations. You can run it on a single desktop without SMP or anything, just as a single process, in which case it's not doing anything parallel. It does all the work in single process itself. And the other case where you can run, uh, it, it supports running a parallel server using MPI, and then you can connect your ParaView client to this parallel server, and then you, are, then you can do distributed data processing as well as rendering. Most clusters don't have uh, a display. They don't have X, they don't have anything like that. How does ParaView actually handle uh, using a cluster, or do you have to move data to like a Viz cluster, or so, can the Viz part be independent of the render part, or I.O. part, or uh, uh, you tell me. So all the things that you said, said are possible. So first, uh, you can, ParaView can run in a mode where it delivers the geometry, the final geometry, not your actual data that you're processing, to the client, and then it renders on the client. So this is very uh, this is feasible when the geometry is like, this is typically possible because you're doing things like isosurfaces or extracting outer shells or something like that and that's what you, so if the, those geometries tend to be much smaller than your data set so you can easily deliver them to the client if that's not possible then you can run ParaView in a mode where you have a separate data processing unit and a separate rendering unit which is so you can set it set it up such that you have a smaller cluster which has access to X and display cards and all that. And then, then ParaView can deliver the geometry to these nodes for rendering. And the, another possible that you can compile with Voice Mesa, or, uh, which is another uh, it's a open source library. It's an open source OpenGL implementation. You can use that on your clusters without X, and it's very well possible to do rendering on the data server. But of course, then you're doing software rendering. All the things. Well, I think that one newer thing I have used Skipped is um, is that um, more recently we have added another library uh, support for another library called Manta, which was uh, which is developed by University of Utah uh, to be able to do actually ray tracing um, on 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 the data server. So it's Mesa uh, and Manta are really uh, two alternatives that we have to just doing it. Uh, where we don't have access to hardware um, hardware for graphics acceleration. And we're back after a crash that none of you heard due to the magic uh, of uh, recording and post-editing and whatnot. But uh, we had some technical difficulties, but now we're back. And Brock, Brock sounds much better now. <laughs> yeah, well, to those with the recording, since I do recording, I always sounded absolutely wonderful. The rest of you guys <laughs> just sounded bad. <laughs> All right, well, now we sound better. All right, so let's uh, let's pick up where we left off here. Um, we were just hearing about uh, the various ways in which rendering occurs in the support libraries and things like that. So let me follow up with a question um, about uh, you mentioned. Uh, I think it was Burke mentioned hardware acceleration for rendering. So this leads to the natural question and uh, flavor du jour of buzzword in the HPC world today about uh, GPUs. So are you guys using GPUs the way they're meant to be used to, to actually render graphics? Uh, so yes, uh, for of course our, our polygonal rendering does indeed go uh, use OpenGL, which uses GPUs for doing the uh, your for the rendering part. But at the same time, we have special implementations for things like volume rendering, or as well as a new surface lick algorithm that we added recently to ParaView, uh, which is again using GPU for doing some GP GPU stuff. Uh, so we have explored in the past uh, some sp using the GPU for special solutions like these, uh, but I guess we are going forward. We are going to investigate more and more using it for general processing and filtering and things like that. So in a lot of systems that have done this, they still to do GL rendering, you need to have X running or something like that. For those of us who have clusters that maybe have. Tesla cards on them that we only have the CUDA library but not the um, full X running. Can you take advantage of that? Can we do any rendering that way? I, I am going to give a non-authoritative answer that um, th there are some libraries out there that try to solve that problem. Um, whether or not they work with you know particular 
uh, card is, you know, it depends a little bit on how much of the uh, um, OpenGL is implemented by the driver. And we actually, we did get various answers from NVIDIA depending on the cards on this. Um, but there are things like uh, virtual GL and such that um, kind of try to allow you to um, bypass essentially X um, to, to do that. And sometimes, so it's sometimes possible and sometimes it's not. It, it really a lot of times depends on the drivers. And in other cases, I've also seen where you can only use a single GPU per MPI rank. And can you guys support like, uh, well, no, there'd be a single GPU for the entire MPI job. Can we do um, multi, uh, a GPU for each MPI process? And then uh, can we even mix that? Can some of the MPI processes have GPUs and some of them not? Yes, that's possible. That you would do by actually, just like the configuration we were talking about earlier, where you have your data processing uh, cluster and your visualization cluster. In this case, your data processing visualization cluster are actually physically overlapping, but you still have a smaller set of nodes that are actually doing the rendering and a larger set of nodes which do the data processing. But yeah, that's possible. You can also, in, in theory, um, there are some th complications to this, but you could, in, in theory, uh, mix um, hardware accelerated OpenGL and Mesa in some cases. Um, so, but I, I, in our experience, um, it is better to actually have multiple uh, cores. So, if, for example, let's say let's say you have a collection of nodes that have um, eight cores per node, but one G, one or two GPUs per node. Uh, it is easier and more efficient to actually have uh, those cores. Um, for, in, in this case, it would be four core. Uh, share the GPU um, rather than saying one core is going to use the GPU and the other ones are going to do software rendering. So you kind of touched on an interesting topic there, and, and this is something, uh, a variant of this we argue about in, in the parallel computing community a lot. How, how much heterogeneity do you run into? Uh, do you run into customers who actually have, have a couple of different types of nodes, you know, like this kind of card over here, that kind of card over here, this guy has X, this does not have X? And I want to use them all together in one, one you know, rendering job. Uh, we don't have that. Yeah, I mean, I have, honestly, in the last 10 years, um, I, have, I have almost never run into people that are mixing and matching cards um, in, in their cluster. Um, I guess for the most part, because people that do use uh, cl clusters uh, to do distributed processing usually have enough funding to actually get uh, and set, set the whole thing up at once. Um, whereas in the other case, people that are, um, are using another more general purpose cluster probably are not using graphics cards in the first place. Let me take a step back then at the beginning is what platforms does Paraview support? So as an end application, um, I'm kind of assuming that you you support all the popular in environments. Is that a, a good assumption? That's correct. We support Linux, uh, 64 bit, 30 bit, Windows, as well as Macs. Uh, uh, and your, you know, any any Unix. Not that we're seeing a lot right. of those anymore, but you know, we used to do. Um, we used to even release binaries for Suns and HPs and uh, SGIs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we don't really do that as much anymore. We we're not seeing a lot okay. of. And on the, okay. server, on the server side, we also support um, uh, supercomputers such as, you know, uh, Cray and um, various IBMs and things like that. Okay, good. That was, that was exactly going to be my next question. So on the front end, it's desktop-y kinds of things. But on the back of supercomputer, you happen to have convenient. Um, so then let me ask a derivative question on that, something that's always annoying but still sometimes interesting. What is the license for Paraview? I went on to Paraview.org and I see a bunch of different licenses there, but let's say I'm a commercial customer and I want to use this. Which, which license am I abiding to? Well, Paraview and VTK both are BSD. So, uh, and I believe all the components that we have that, are, that come with the Paraview source once you check out the repository are indeed under BSD. Right. One, one exception to that is that uh, for uh, Graphical user interface. We use the Qt library or Qt library, 
um, and that is licensed on, on the various license, but we were using the LGPL license of, of Q. So it does bring a, uh, some additional complication if you are a developer that want to build on top of Pairview, um, you have something that's coming be, that's BSD and then something else that's LGPL, and you have to make sure that you um, you adhere to both of those licenses. So that actually leads me into my next question: uh, making Pairview extensible, making it support. Um, file formats that doesn't support out of the box. Of course, it supports the VTK formats out of the box, XDMF, and a few others. I want to expand it to support my proprietary application and ship it with me. The BSD makes it nice that I can write that. How hard is it to write a new um, I.O. plugin to understand my file format, both for serial I.O. and parallel I.O.? So, uh... The first thing that you need to do to write uh, to bring in your uh, reader into Perview is write a VTK based reader for it. So you need to understand some of the basics of how to how to create a reader in VTK, like, uh, the different things about the pipeline, how to uh, how to satisfy requests, and how to provide information about the data. That you need to be aware of. But once you have that figured out, once you have a VTK read, VTK based reader that works. It's very easy to bring that into Perview. All you do is there are, you can do that through a plugin and you just write a bunch of XML uh, that allows you to import that reader into Paraview. Uh, the same holds for Parallel as well. You just fought, there are uh, so in VTK uh, when you're running in Parallel, different requests come down the pipeline asking for different parts of the data. And so long as your reader respects that, uh, you're good. Uh, you, your reader is Parallel aware, and that that just automatically works with Paraview. Alternatively, if you have uh, if you have a Python library or some a Python wrapped library that you can use, in which case, Paraview already supports something called as a Python programmable source, which is almost like a data source which, where it allows the user to put in any arbitrary Python script to generate the data. So that could be a very easy entry point for people who already have a Python interface for their uh, reader library that they want to use. So when I make this reader, do I have to compile it into pair review or can I load it up as a dynamic object or something like that? Right, yes. You compile as a separate plugin, uh, not into, you don't directly compile it into pair review. You compile it as a plugin that's separate, which creates a shared library that then can be loaded into pair review. Okay, so no need to rebuild everything every time I want to do something. That's nice. Right. And plus, starting with uh, the most recent release, we're also uh, distributing the development binaries of pair review, so you, can, you, you don't even have to build pair review to build the plugins. You can directly, uh, so by development binaries, I mean a package with the header files and libs and all that. Yeah, one, one exception to this, of course, is if you uh, have to deploy in a platform uh, that does not support shared objects, such as the IBM Blue Gene, um, then you, you, you have to recompile the whole thing. Well, not recompile, actually. You have to relink the whole thing with the additional code that you compiled. So talking about plugins and whatnot, uh, this leads to the natural question of uh, contributors. So you mentioned Sandia and Los Alamos. Who, who else is involved in the, uh, in the Paraview community contributes code? Um, so the, the main development um, comes from uh, mainly Los Alamos, Sandia, um, and Kitware. Um, and we have then a... a Somewhat large number um, of developers that um, that are from different organizations. It's it's you know too too many to list here. Um, some examples, for example, we uh, we uh, we had contributions, actually a fair amount of contributions from um, EDF, which is the um, uh, French electrical electric company, Electricité de France. Uh, we have we have had uh, collaborations uh, with University of Utah, uh, the Ski Institute. Uh, the Vistrails group there, we've been working with them for a while, and uh, they have uh, developed uh, modules for PEVI, especially for Vistrails um, integration. Um, and then, you know, there's, there are, there's probably um, it's something in the order of 10, 15 uh, developers that, you know, on and off contribute that are coming from a variety of um, organizations. So I, I couldn't help but notice that you said one of the Contributors with the Ski Institute in Utah. Are these a bunch of ski bums? <laughs> or what, what is that? 
Um, SKI is, uh, stands for Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute uh, at the University of Utah, so it's with a C, not with a K. Um, and uh, they are at Utah, so they probably like skiing too, but um, not really directly related. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was actually thinking the same thing there, Jeff. <laughs> So, so uh, uh, pair view and tile displays. Uh, some Viz applications work with the tile display directly, and some rely on a third-party tool to actually tile um, the image across. How does pair view handle handling tile displays? Uh, pair view actually uses IST to do its uh, rendering, tile rendering, and which includes tile displays as well. Ken, do you want to elaborate? Right. Uh, so, as Lucar said, uh, pair view uses IST. Um, which provides the scalable sort last rendering on tile displays. Now, I'm not going to go into details about ICT as we just recently did an entire RC podcast on the subject. But suffice it to say that tile display support works out of the box with ParaView. So to use a tile display, you simply run one of the render capable ParaView servers on the computer driving the tile display and then tell ParaView server the number of tiles wide and the number of tiles high the display is. Then ParaView will take care of the rest. Um, I want to add something. Um, Ice T rocks. No, in the discussion with Ken about Ice T, I was pretty impressed of just like how much better it performed over some of the other options out there. It definitely seems really interesting. And actually, uh, we're in the process of maybe building a tile display here at Michigan. Finally, after a long time, the School of Information is doing something. And Ice T is actually one of the first things I want to get going on it, probably via pair review. So we'll we'll, we'll see <laughs> that goes. So to have this whole thing work, we need to have X running on there and pair review and Ice T just kind of fires up in full screen on each of the tiles. And there's an XML file that says where each tile is, or is it more complicated than that to actually have pair view display on each one of the tiles correctly? Uh, that's basically it. If you have X running so that you're actually driving the uh, uh, the displays for the tile display, then ParaView will automatically do a full screen view on each one of those and set up the tile display for you. Um, it will make a, some assumptions about the layout, uh, so you should set up your MPI ranks accordingly. But otherwise, it's, it's fairly automatic. Uh, one technical note that you should be aware of is that in order for ICT to perform really efficiently on large data sets, you should have more compute nodes than you have tiles. So ParaView will actually take advantage of the extra compute power you provide so that it can render even faster. Okay, let me ask a follow-up on that. So you say you know, have more nodes than, uh, than tiles. Is, do you want to have a, a fixed ratio, like a 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 or something like that? Or can ParaView or IST handle uh, you know, a non-even ratio, 1 and a half to 1 or, or 2 and a half or 2 and a third to 1 or something like that? There is no fixed ratio. Uh, ParaView will just use as many any processes that you've specified in the MPI job, and you've told it how big the tile display is, so it will just know which one to display on. But regardless, it will use all of your, your nodes in order to do the compositing and rendering of the images. So how much you actually want that ratio it really depends on how much geometry, you know, how big your initial mesh is that you're trying to render. If it's something fairly small, obviously you don't need very many. But if the larger your input mesh is, the more compute power you're going to need to render it in an efficient manner. So a, a little bit of clarification here, not having used pair view uh, on anything besides my laptop so far. There's like these I.O. servers, render servers, and then there's like the servers that are running on the display wall. Is this all one MPI job, or should the the, the MPI processes running on the on the like render nodes are they a different MPI run? And I tell them where a like a a socket is for the MPI run that's running on the display wall, or does do you just describe all this to pair view and it just does the right thing? Okay, uh, Utkash is pointing at me to answer the question. Um, so the, the the different modes that Utkash described um, can uh, kind of do a combination of what you described. So if you are running pair view in just a cl just simple client server mode, um, the server then is actually doing the I/O, um, the, the processing, as well as the rendering. 
Um, and in that case, the server is just one MPI job. Um, having said that, what Ken was referring to as having um, a, a, a MPI job that has more ranks than there are uh, displays um, is also valid for this case. So you, essentially, you're just saying that the first six nodes, let's say, um, are driving the tile, whereas the other nodes are doing contributing to processing I.O. and rendering, but they are not driving the tiles. They do the, the, the sort last compositing takes care of where the final images go and then that they get displayed. Um, in the data server, render server client mode, um, you actually have one MPI job, which is the data server that's responsible of I.O. Um, and processing. Um, and it, what it will do is that it will generate geometry, uh, polygonal geometry. And then there's another MPI job which is running uh, on the, the display clusters or the VIS cluster, so to speak, um, that's responsible of getting the geometry um, and rendering it. And the two talk to each other through over TCP IP sockets. And of course, the client talks to both, um, both of these server types uh, over sockets as well. Okay, so then uh, another thing after that, I noticed that there's a config file where you can describe a cave environment. Uh, for those who don't know what a cave is, it's like an, an immersive where you've got displays all around you. Uh, what's Paraview's support for cave like? Uh, so Paraview's support for cave is still, uh, I would say, in its infancy. We are currently working on it to make it much better. So our current solution is... Uh, we, we don't use IST for cave rendering. What we simply do is the geometry is distributed to all the rendering nodes. Everyone gets the full geometry, and then every tile just renders renders its own thing based on its uh, its orientation, which is different for every tile in a cave. And uh, we just and the client simply synchronizes all these together. Uh, and client acts as the driver where you're interacting. The user interacts with uh, the scene using the client. So we have also been working currently to add support for tracking uh, to this framework. So people have, we've been playing with using uh, VRPN, uh, which is virtual reality peripheral network. Virtual reality peripheral network, uh, which is a library which allows you to interface with different devices, uh, which are typically used in such VR environments. Yeah, I, I want to clarify that a little bit. So. Um, when you're within a cave, um, a lot of times you don't want to necessarily use a mouse to interact with your visualization to rotate it, etc. So they, they they support a variety of um, devices um, that and we, we you know we want to support those devices. And and one of these things that's uh, kind of special is essentially head tracking, where um, there will be some cameras or some system designed to essentially track your uh, head position and orientation um, and adjust the scene accordingly. Um, so uh, we haven't had support for uh, head tracking in any of these other devices, and we're working now uh, in introducing that support to, to Paraview. Okay, so tech. Well, where, where would the con scene Paraview used? I, I think we've all gotten used to seeing these dynamic fly-throughs of the weather on the 6 o'clock news and things like that. Has Paraview been used in any, you know, widely seen outside the sign community um, kind of simulations like a movie, commercial, or any commercial kinds of application widespread? Um, Paraview is, is used by a large number of um, organizations um, going, you know, from from government to academia to to the industry, and yeah, we do have we uh, we do have partners and customers uh, from the industry that couple Paraview obviously with uh, some of the major uh, simulation codes um, for for the purpose of um, post processing. Um, and, and another interesting thing is that um, there is a um, popular um, CFD code uh, called Open Foam that you may have heard of. Uh, it's it's an open source GPL um, parallel uh, CFD code, um, and Paraview is their official adapted um, post processing uh, code. So if you if you actually get Open Foam, you would get Paraview with it. So what's coming in uh, new future versions of Paraview? What are you guys working on right now? 
So one of the main things that we are really excited about is uh, web visualization. So we've been working on adding support for exposing Fairview's large data visualization capabilities through a browser. And uh, so that's, uh, we almost have, we can say an alpha now. So we have that out and people are excited about it and we are, uh, we are now working on integrating it with uh, different uh, web plat uh, platforms. Uh, then another thing is uh, adding support for collaboration. So which in entails that you have multiple Perview, uh, Perview sessions running on different desktops at different locations, and they all share and look at the same data set, and they uh, communicate with each other to, uh, so that you can interactively visualize to, as a group. Uh, then uh, there's uh, in situ processing and co-processing. Uh, Ken, do you want to talk about that? Sure, I'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, the uh, Paraview co-processing library is basically a fairly small library attached to uh, the Paraview services that allows you to run uh, the Paraview analysis subservient to something like a simulation. So the idea being is that you can run a large-scale simulation, and while it's running and while the, the actual data is still in the core memory, you can fire off this analysis and visualization to produce possibly images or, or some other extracted information that, that generally is a lot smaller than the original data that you started with. So you, you, end up, you start with a very large three-dimensional mesh, you may end up with a, a fairly small image or uh, a contour which typically is much smaller than the original mesh or just some sort of extracted surface or feature. And that way you can run it uh, in a much more temporally fine manner so they don't have to dump everything out the disk and then load it up again. Cool. Well, let me ask a question that I like to ask a lot of other software developers and guests that we have here in RC. Which uh, uh, um, source code repository do you use and, and why? I just like to hear people's reasons for what they use. We use Git. Yeah, are you going to talk about the reasons why we use Git? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, one of the reasons why we use Git is because it's much easier to create forks and work with so we have simultaneously we have parallel developments going on, right? We have these different projects driving, doing different things on Paraview at the same time. So that has become insanely simplified once we have switched to Git, and everyone can have their own uh, forks off of Paraview, which are do it, take, uh, doing their own feature and enhancements. And once they are done with it, they can push back to the master repository. So, so that's really working well. Yeah, and from a VTK perspective. Um, because VTK is a, is a large project uh, de developed by a large community, uh, we wanted to leverage the distributed uh, version control capabilities of Git. Um, and also actually it allowed us to even grow our community further because we don't necessarily have to give um, everybody um, right access to our central repository. Rather, people can um, push uh, to things like um, a mirror, for example, that may, we may have on GitHub or Gitorius or some, something like that, uh, and just uh, make a pull request to us, uh, as it's called. Essentially, that's, they send an email saying that, hey, I have this branch on GitHub uh, for pair of you. Um, this is something that may be of interest to you. Can you please pull, pull this change to, to your central repository? Of course, we had our, our, our challenges uh, working with Git also. It's not necessarily the easiest, um, easiest tool to use. So uh, Paraview was made for doing very large, like Ken said, like the national labs tend to work with things that are bigger than the average academic and uh, public researcher. What's the largest thing you've ever viewed with Paraview in terms of number of cores required to even fit it in memory or uh, geometry? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. So the scientific work at Sandia produces you know, some of the largest models that we visualize with Paraview. The really big data sets, uh, the stuff that comes from the hero size simulations using the entirety of one of the world's largest supercomputers, they, they tend to come in sporadic but important thrusts that are driven by scientific need and supercomputing availability. Our last such thrust was in 2008 when we analyzed the results of a shock physics code comprising several billion cells and hundreds of thousands of blocks. Now that said, Sandia and Los Alamos National Laboratory are in the process of jointly building a new petascale computer called Cielo. 
As this system comes online, we expect a new wave of these simulation thrusts to occur as scientists start to leverage the new resource. So in preparation, we're running several scaling studies. For example, we've loaded a super-sampled astrophysics data set containing over 40 billion cells. And we've also stress-tested the system with an internally generated data set containing over a trillion cells. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, from my perspective, and this is um, mostly coming from more the um, our academic partners from the more the NSF community. Um, uh, on the uh, in situ, we're right now we're actually um, working on doing some scalability studies, um, and we have scaled our code on up to thirty-two thousand cores. So this is essentially the simulation running on thirty-two thousand cores, but it is coupled with um, with Paraview, um, in Paraview doing the processing on the same same as part of the same MPI job essentially. Um, when we talk about large data also, there's, there's, there's a little bit kind of differences between doing this sort of in situ or batch processing. Uh, for example, I asked around uh, before the podcast, and um, there's, there's a group at uh, UCSD, um, and they have actually run Paraview uh, on up to one trillion particles. They have a particle data. And we're talking about one just one field within this particle uh, data uh, being around 100 gigabytes. So when they load something on the order of, you know, 10 to 20 of these things, they are, you know, going beyond uh, terabyte scale. And so that's the kind of more batch processing. Uh, on the interactive processing side, actually, um, the, the the kind of the numbers that Ken were given, those are interactive analysis. So we're really running it on a, running it on a this cluster and. Um, we want to be expect to get something on the order of several frames a second to interactively uh, do that. Uh, and one um, number I got from this is uh, a scalability study we did uh, we did with the uh, together with the tech uh, scientists, the tech, Texas Computing Center, um, and we did a essentially four k cubed volume. So that's about sixty four billion voxels. Um, we interactively volume rendered that um, on or using our hardware. Uh, accelerated uh, GPU uh, volume render. And that's, to look at the scale, that's about, on, only one of the fields there is about uh, 256 gigabytes. And when you're bringing multiple fields and you have multiple time steps, you're, you're really getting, you know, on larger um, terabyte size. So those are some of the numbers. I mean, this, obviously these are the stuff that we have done or we have, we have known. Uh, the larger communities, you know, doing out there using our, our tools to do large data, and so there's, I'm sure there's some hero runs that we haven't heard of yet. So for the uh, batch runs, uh, Paraview supports some sort of scripting, like a Python interface or its own. Yes, Paraview supports Python interface. So we have a Python-based API that allows you to create visualizations and configure parameters and do renderings and so on and so forth. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time. I'm excited to get pair of you going on display wall if it gets built around here. And uh, where uh, can people find pair of you? And is there something like a mailing list? Or how can people get involved? We have mailing lists, bug trackers, and all that stuff. The easiest thing to do is to just go to pairofview.org um, and then follow the links. I think I believe there's a tab there that says help, um, and there's a bunch of entries in there pointing to our wikis and web pages and uh, the documentation and the mailing list, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, guys. All right. Thanks for your time, Don. Take care.